Yep, uh, my name's Stephen. I'm here to tell you what exactly is uh, going on in your various projects. So today, this is the second time I've given this talk, and same as last time, I had people come up to me before this asking what is this talk actually about. Um, it gives me a bit of liberty to kind of decide what I want to make it about. So I'm going to talk about this guy called Nigel who had a dream. I'm not actually going to talk about Nigel. Uh, thank God, because that would be awful. Um, instead, I'm going to talk today about versioning, uh, managing change, and documenting change in Python projects. So I'm going to have a look at six different projects that all, are all available on PyPy that you can use to do this within your project. So before we do that, I'm going to give a little introduction to my, about myself, and I'm going to have a hard time with this, by the way, because my laptop is down at the back of the room, so bear with me if I need to jump backwards and forwards. So yeah, I'm Stephen. I work at Red Hat. I've been working at Red Hat for about four years now. Um, during those four years, I've been working exclusively on OpenStack, mostly as an upstream developer. For anyone that's not aware of what OpenStack is, um, it was the cool kid on the block until Kubernetes came around and stole our thunder. Um, it's a cloud orchestration OS, if you want to call it that, made up of a load of different projects. So we have a project for the virtualization side of things, we have a project for networking, we have a whole load of utility projects, some of which I'm going to look at today. And the idea is that you can go and deploy this on a fleet of servers and manage virtual machines in a cloudy, self-provisioned manner. So OpenStack, the entirety of OpenStack is Python. And that means that I'd say OpenStack as a community is probably one of the biggest Python users in the world, just in sheer amounts, sheer amounts of lines of code written, uh, Python code. So starting from the top, versioning 101, why is it important and why should you matter, or why should it matter? So if you're writing, this matters, you, if you're writing a project, it usually falls into one or two categories. It's a, a service, so you know, a, a web service or something like that, or it's a library. If it's a service, uh, versioning is maybe less important outside of debugging uh, customer issues and that kind of thing. If it's a library, though, uh, versioning is absolutely crucial just for dependency management and that kind of thing. So if your project is never going to change or evolve, you don't need to worry about a version because it's never going to change, but pretty much everything has bugs and it has new feature requests and so forth. So Python very helpfully has this PEP and a couple of other um, PEPs as well around how to actually do versioning for um, a library, a Python library. Uh, it gives a whole list of different things that you're supposed to match and it also gives you a couple of different options. Uh, your typical version, more complex version number that you're going to see is something like this. Um, I'm not going to bother explaining what all of it means. I'm hoping most of it is self-explanatory. But uh, the two versioning types usually fall into one or two camps. You've got your semantic versioning, uh, which pretty much everyone uses nowadays, with the exception of um, Ubuntu, for example, and libraries like DPDK. They use calendar versioning, so 1804 released in April of 2018, that kind of thing. So how do you actually, you want to expose this information and you want to expose a whole load more information to your users and you want to do that in as easy a manner as possible. How do you go about doing that? So the first problem that I'm going to look at is how do you actually expose that versioning from the library itself? So if I import that library within um, my code, how am I able to inspect that and figure out what features are available and so forth. So there's two, the main way of doing this is to integrate it into setup tools or whatever packaging tool you're using, Flit or something like that. Uh, there's a couple of libraries that are available for integrating automatic versioning into um, setup tools. I'm gonna focus on two of them today. Uh, Setup Tools SCM and PBR. Um, the first of these, Setup Tools SCM, that's an example of a set up the PY file. 
you put in some configuration into your setup tools file, and you use git tags uh, to tag a release as you make it. You build your wheel and your various SDs and stuff, you upload it to PyPy, and everything just happens automatically without you needing to do anything more than that git tag. The other thing is PPR, which works almost the exact same way. So PPR of these two things, PPR is the OpenStack project, it's the thing that we use for better or worse across every single project within OpenStack. So yeah, like I said, you tag things, you build your SDs, you push it up with Twine or whatever you're going to use, and things just work, which is quite nice. And uh, in terms of which one you're actually going to choose, uh, Setup Tools SCM does versioning, and that's all it does. PBR does a whole load of other stuff which you may not necessarily want or you may want, so it'll generate a changelog file for you, it'll generate an authors file for you, it'll include release notes in your SDIS if you're using a particular tool that I'm gonna cover later and so forth. Um, definitely worth looking into these uh, if you don't already have your homegrown tool, which I've read, I've been told a lot of people have. The second uh, step that you wanna do once you actually have your versions is how do you communicate what? has those version numbers actually mean. So I've released library one dot foo. Uh, what is the difference between that and the previous version? The typical way that you would have done this, or that most people would do this, is they write a giant ass change log, or they write a news file, or they put it in a wiki somewhere, or they don't bother doing anything at all. So this is a, an example of the change log taken from the Sphinx project, which is a big, the documentation tool of choice around Python uh, communities. All they have is a news file in the root of their repo, and every single time you submit a pull request, they will ask you to modify that news file and then deal with the inevitable merge conflicts when someone else beats you to it. But it works, and it's a hell of a lot better than having nothing. But we can do better. Or at least we hope we can do better. For those uh, for solving this, there's two projects that I look at. First one is Town Crier, and the second one is Reno. Yet again, OpenStack plug, the second one is an OpenStack project and has more power whether or not you need it. So Town Crier is used for projects like Tux. Um, Tux, the virtual M test runner thingy. Uh, what that looks like is, um, actually, before I say that, uh, the Reno, like I said, is used for OpenStack projects. So Town Cry Up, you use these news fragment files. So instead of every, putting everything into a news file, you dump it into a, another file with a description, usually linked to a pull, uh, an open issue on GitHub or whatever your issue tracker tends to be, almost always GitHub nowadays. Uh, and then some slug that says this is, um, this is the type of uh, change that this release note uh, corresponds to. So a feature, a bug fix, so forth. This is all configurable, obviously. Um, and it's all written in restructured text. They might support Markdown. I haven't checked. I haven't written Markdown outside of forums for a while because I have restructured text. But you dump this into a file, and you run Town Cryer then. You can run it in draft with this draft flag. It'll show you exactly what it will print out, and then you run it without the flag, and it'll dump into a news file, and it'll delete those fragments from your history so you're not carrying them around for infinity. Um, the advantage of this is that you have, between two minor releases or two major releases, you can build up this inventory of release note fragments. At the, when it comes to releasing them, before you tag your commit, you run this command, you dump everything into a news file, Boom, there goes your release. Reno, on the other hand, takes a slightly different approach to this, uh, a cleverer approach or a more complex approach, depending on your perspective. It doesn't, uh, in, firstly, it encodes all of the information about what type of change you're talking about inside the actual release note fragments themselves. So where Town Cryer was using just plain old restructured text, what Reno uses is a YAML file with a list, uh, or a dictionary, I guess would be the term, um, corresponding to items. So you could have features, you can have bugs. Again, this is all configurable, but by default, features, bugs, upgrade notes, this kind of thing. And 
when you, you come around to releasing, you don't actually have to do anything because Reno um, doesn't work by combining stuff manually. Instead, it ties into your Git history. So it will look back through your Git history and it will match when a release note was committed to various tags. And you'll say, give me all of the via Sphinx directives, you'll say, give me all of the release notes between versions 1.1 and 1.2. And it will filter out everything that doesn't, that was added outside of those ranges and only in include the stuff that occurred in between that. So it tends to be a little bit slower to run, but it means that from a, an end user release perspective, you have to do absolutely nothing other than release. The third and final thing, uh, again, this mostly applies to um, libraries, more so than services, is what do you do when you decide that something is really, really bad and it needs to, be, needs to die? You need to kill it as fast as possible or you need to move it to another module or you just want to shuffle stuff around without breaking people's hearts and like, we're not, we don't need a Python 2, 3 thing in the library sense. So you could document it all. You can put this into release notes using Reno or a plain news file. But the problem is that developers tend to hate writing documentation. And on top of that, the documentation isn't usually machine readable, which means that you need to sit down, go through the release notes, and pass all of the stuff that has changed between different versions which, you can, as you can imagine, for a larger project will get fairly tiresome. So instead, you're going to treat the code as your documentation. And there are multiple big projects that do exactly this. So Django has been talked about a couple of times already today. That's a really good example of a project that does this documentation is the code. So if you try importing something that has been deprecated in Django, uh, in a given release, you'll get big, ugly deprecation warnings if you switch them on um, every time, like as soon as you start your application. And that is a signal that you should go and fix this deprecated call to switch to whatever the new thing they told you to use is before you update to the breaking future version 3.0 or 4.0 or whatever it ends up being. Sphinx does something very, very similar. If you try to build documentation, and some extension that you're using, that you've written yourself, or that you've imported is using broken or deprecated features. It'll warn you as part of the build, and you can go and fix those things um, before they come and kick you in the ass down the road. So if you want to do this yourself, again, two projects. One of them is OpenStack. One of them is not OpenStack. Uh, deprecation and debt collector. So of the two of these, Deprecation is by far the simpler of the two, um, but they both provide a very kind of similar mechanic for how you actually use them. Deprecation works by way of a load of decorators. So those decorators give you the opportunity to say why this thing has been deprecated, be it a class or a function or a method, and when it was deprecated and when it's actually going to be removed, assuming you're planning on removing it. It's been deprecated for removal. So that's an example of it there. Um, nothing outrageously complex. And if you try and run this, you'll get warnings like this popping up in your code. Uh, or more specifically, you're working on a library, your end user will get a warning uh, popping up in their code saying, stop doing this because it's bad. Debt collector works quite similarly. Gives you a little, like if you go back, You'll notice the arguments and stuff for this basic example are almost the exact same. And if you run it, you will get, again, almost the exact same output. The difference, though, with debt collector um, and deprecation is that it gives debt collector has a far richer API. So you can, you not only can you mark something as deprecated for removal or just deprecated even if you're not going to remove it, you can say, I have moved this thing into another module and set up essentially a sim link that will allow people to keep reference in the old location um, and then update at some point in the future. So that's incredibly useful if you're talking about a large a library where you naturally have to do some refactoring over the course of the library as it 
grows ugly over time. And that same thing, if you run it, will give you this. So yeah, in summary, um, three ways, three things to think about if you're talking about change, uh, how to actually manage versioning in your project, uh, use your packaging tools. Don't try and do this manually because it's a complete and utter waste of time. Uh, you, how do you document those changes? Again, use tools to do this because um, for anything larger than a one person project, people stomping on each other's release notes is not fun. And then finally, how do you indicate to people consuming your library that something has changed from a programmatic perspective? Use one of those two libraries. Um, and if you, unless you have something homegrown, in which case keep using the homegrown thing. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Let's ask everyone to just get the mic from me before questions. No hard ones. Thank you very much. This might be uh, heresy, but um, um, are any of these usable in, uh, in, a different, in the context of a different language, or are they tied into Python and its uh, syntax and its distribution mechanisms? So the, from the perspective of packaging and how you'd actually indicate deprecations within your library, both of those would be Python-specific. The first is tied into Python's packaging ecosystem, and the latter is tied into decorators and Python code. But the two release note managers that I outlined, so Towncrier and Reno, both of those have nothing. They're both written in Python, but outside of that, there's no tie. The only tie for Reno would be that you have to use a Git repo, but realistically, you're probably using a Git repo today anyway, so, yeah. Any other questions? Um, Sorry. Sphinx is kind of annoying. Like, um, does, do you have any solve for that? Like, it's uh, like you have so many nice tools, like for like writing release notes, managers, and stuff like that. But like, have you ever seen the documentation for Sphinx? It's like so. I, I'm one of the, the Sphinx maintainers, uh, <laughs> and I'm also the person that's working on rewriting in my spare time all of the Sphinx documentation because it is awful. Um, ironic that a documentation tool would have such poor documentation, but. Um, there's a few things you can do from the Sphinx perspective in terms of uh, how you run it that isn't very well exposed uh, to run things faster. Visual Studio Code, for example, has um, uh, at least one extension that will re regenerate your Sphinx documentation on the fly instead of having to delete everything and run Sphinx build and wait for an hour for your documentation to build. Um, from the perspective, though, of general the fact that things like you need to compile your documentation to get an end result, it's just it's part of the parcel of Sphinx being so powerful. There is, it's never going to be as easy to write and use as something like Common Mark, for example, because with great power comes great frustration, unfortunately. But yeah, I'm well aware of the, the state of the Sphinx documentation, and I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some, something that I find quite interesting, it's kind of slightly off topic, is that if you install a package in Python, that it doesn't add it to the requirements. Um, and then you have the whole pip freeze requirements dot in situation. Do you have, are you, do, are, you using, are you using some kind of third party tool? Like there's, I don't know what they're called, pip tools or something? So my, like I said, most of my work, uh, like my day job is OpenStack, so I'm constrained but in OpenStack by the tools that OpenStack use, which is PBR, which is based on setup tools. But you've got things like pipenv, which will, apparently the code itself is a horror show, but from a usability perspective, it'll do a lot of this management for you. But yeah, th that's a whole, there's issues around how Py like you can install multiple versions of Python packages they can't coexist um, without using, you have to use virtual limbs to get around that and that kind of thing. Nah. Uh, pip no. compile. Yeah. Extra step for sure, just bake it into your flow. Yeah. Pip env is probably the place to start though. Yep.
Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, what is your opinion on packages, um, let's say like Angular, that generate release notes from git commits versus putting actual files in the repo? So I meant pros and cons. Yeah, I mentioned that PBR, that uh, tool that could do the versioning for you. One of the things it'll do is it'll generate an author's file and it'll also generate a changelog file. The problem with using that is that it for it it hampers drive-by commits because you have to say we won't accept this commit unless it's in this particular format because this commit message is no longer just a commit message, it is now documentation, and therefore it has to have a certain flow and stuff. And especially for things like, um, like working on GitHub, GitHub tends to abstract away the idea of commits in favor of a pull request. So we did it for a while in OpenStack, and we found that it was just too much of a hindrance. It was much better to be able to use the commit message to say what the code was doing, the ch code change was doing, and then use a separate thing, separate uh, thing to track um, what the overall impact to an end user was. It was a different perspective, essentially. So small projects, it probably works. For bigger projects, not so much. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you.